to In Conversation with writer and editor Sheila Bender, Discussions on the Writing Life, a monthly chat with writers, publishers, and those who support the literary arts. Hello. Today we're in the studio with Cheryl Merrill, local Port Townsend writer, and we're going to be talking today about her body of work, which has to do with elephants and nature in Africa, as well as her building of her author platform and her publishing progress, which is quite impressive. So welcome, Cheryl. Thanks for having me, Sheila. I really am excited to be here. Thanks. I should read your bio before we begin. Cheryl's essays have been published in four genre, Pilgrimage, Brevity, Seams, South Loop Review, Goatee, Alaska Quarterly Review, Adventum, and Isotope. Singing like, wow, Cheryl, what is that like? Ema Sumac. And if you know that name, it dates you quite a bit. All right. Hmm. Was that particular essay was selected for the Best of Brevity 2005 and Creative Nonfiction number 27. It was also included in the anthology Short Takes, Model Essays for Composition, 10th edition. Another essay, Trunk, was chosen for special mention in Pushcart 2008. She is currently working on a book about elephants larger than life living in the shadows of elephants, which we'll talk about quite a bit. But perhaps you can um, help us all get dated by explaining what that title means. Well, obviously, larger than life refers to the size of elephants. They are massive creatures, especially the ones that I visit in the Okavango Delta area of uh, Botswana. And they're also, their personas are larger than life. They're, um, they have been written about since man first started writing. In fact, they are, I've seen rock paintings in um, Africa of elephants. So obviously, men and elephants, humans and elephants have had uh, a long history. Uh, living in the shadows of elephants, I hope, gives the impression of being really up close and personal to them, um, as well as sort of a, what would you say, sort of a, a, a reflection of the long history of uh humans and elephants. Um, they literally grew up together in Africa. Mm. So I bring both of those notions into the book. And where in your history did you get involved with elephants? Well, the first time I went to Africa was in 1996. Um, I had gotten a very small um, inheritance, and I'd always been fascinated by National Geographic and all the photos in it from the time I could even pick up a book. So I decided that I wanted to go to Africa, so I went. And I had um, a day-long experience with the three elephants that I visited in, that I visit all the time in Africa. And that really got me set on thinking about elephants. I thought I was going to Africa to see lions. Everybody wants to see all that, you know, lions making a kill and, and that sort of thing. But the elephants were just mesmerizing. And um, they basically sort of... Uh, revealed themselves everywhere I went in Africa. We just kept bumping into elephants. So I figured I should um, start writing about them a little bit. And uh, that's when I started. So the work that you have published in all these various quite quality literary magazines is work about elephants? Pretty much. Uh, there's a couple of nature essays that were published in Brevity. Um, however, the one you were talking about <laughs> singing like Ema <laughs> Sumac is about elephants. For those who are <clears throat> too young to know this, Ema Sumac was a Peruvian um, singer who could, her voice had a huge range. She could do um, A above high C, and she could also go very, very low. So, um, And she could do an occasional, um, what they call a triple trill, singing three notes at once. And so I compare the, that, that range of human uh, voice to what elephants can do, which is just totally amazing because they can go from infrasound up to a trumpet, which is as loud as a jet engine. Whoa. And you have witnessed all of this. I have never heard infrasound because it's below the range of human hearing, but I've felt it. Um, you can feel it in your chest, um, like the, you can feel when a marching band goes by and the drums, you can feel that vibration in your chest. Um, so that's kind mm -hmm. of what, if you're close enough, what infrasound feels like, but I've never heard it. Wow. Had you been writing before you decided you should be writing about elephants? 
Um, yes, actually, before I started uh, writing prose, I did. Uh, I was writing poetry. Um, Copper Canyon Press actually printed a small chat book of mine a bazillion yes. years yeah. ago. <laughs> and that, that's a, quite an achievement. Yeah, yeah, it was back in the days yeah. of letterpress. Um, and so I had had some poems published, but um, I wasn't doing it regularly. Once I started writing prose, I pretty much started writing regularly. Did your poetry influence your prose? I hope so. I know that you've read some of it. Yes, so I have. <laughs> I, I hope that you get that feeling from it. I do get it, but I wanted to hear you say it as the author. Where in your process of deciding that you would write about the elephants and in this publication record, did you realize that you were working on a whole book? Pretty early. I did a workshop with Terry Tempest Williams in 2002. And I know that sounds like a long ways from 1996, but you know how life gets in the way of everything that you try to do. So I uh, worked with her at that workshop and told her that, you know, I was really trying to think of writing a book about elephants, and she highly encouraged me to do it. So I guess from that point forward, I really um, started thinking seriously about a book. But you continued, and very wisely, to publish shorter pieces. So did you mind the work you were doing towards the book and shape it for smaller pieces, or were they adjunct pieces to what you were doing? No, actually, they were pieces that I was working on for the book, and I kept thinking, well, gee, this would make a nice small essay for brevity. And so that's how I started publishing. Actually, the very first essay I published in brevity was a nature essay about two different types of light and what that means. So it wasn't elephants. Mm -hmm. But uh, the second one, the singing like Ema Sumac, <laughs> was definitely elephant. elephants. Right. right. I think that that's impressive and something that most of us writers need encouragement about. We tend to think, well, we have this book project and we just need to stick to it. We need to have the whole thing done and someone has to read it from the beginning to the end to really get what we're doing. And yet, when it comes time to publish a book, the editors and agents want to know what your publication record is, and therefore it is wise to have been publishing all along these many years that you're working on a book. And I know in your case, your book has been one that you're working on for many years, and it necessitated returning visits to visit the elephants again, and writing and restructuring and all of that, and we'll, we'll get to it. So what kind of a commitment did you feel, or how did you maintain your interest in the shorter essays and shaping them and getting them out? as well as working full-time and working on your book? Well, I guess it's excitement. When you work on a piece of writing and it's coming together, whether it's a page or two or five or ten, and you get so excited in that, in that process that you start thinking about, well, gee, this is good enough. It should get published out there somewhere. So then you take a look at it as a piece, as a whole, rather than part of a bigger project. And you can edit it down. And the section on singing like Ema Sumac is actually almost three pages long. And it ended up being brevity, which is, I think, is it 600 words? It's short. Yeah, it's very short. So... You know, you can work on both things, and actually the one feeds the other. When you're editing something for an essay, sometimes you'll see things that you'll think, oh, yeah, well, that wasn't so hot. Maybe I'll leave it out of the book. It makes you think about sentences a whole lot more and how they work together. So you see the whole endeavor as a whole. One feeds the other. Basically, yes, I do. And before we leave the topic of brevity, which is a fabulous online magazine of short nonfiction, which is still publishing all these years later, since you were in there in 2005. Is your essay archived? Yes, it is. Um, Brevity has a wonderful website. It's part of the Creative Nonfiction website. Dinty Moore, who is the editor of Brevity, has his own Facebook page and quite frequently, well, every day, actually, I think he posts sort of small little pieces of other essays and prompts, writing prompts and encouragements. And so he's a good guy to like if you're on <laughs> Facebook, because it's always positive. It's never like, okay, give it up, you'll never be good, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. So you can Google both Denty Moore. It's two O's, M-O-O-R-E, and uh, the Brevity website. And would, your name? Oh, yeah. Um, you can Google my name connected with Brevity, and it should pop right up. You can read about the sound of elephants. 
Right. <laughs> yeah, you can read about okay. the sound of elephants. Right. And I have some links to that type of thing and to other magazines that I've published in on my website, which is obviously my name, www.cherylmerrill.com. Two, to- two R's and two L's. Okay. C- C-H-E-R-Y-L-M-E-R-R-I-L-L. You have a rhyming name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know because we have been in writing groups together, that as your book has been progressing and as your publication record is progressing, so is the world progressing. And you have been a person who has done a good job of doing what we're told to do as authors now, which is build our platform so that when our book is out there looking for an agent, looking for a publisher, and they say, what is your platform? How many readers do you have? Why would people be interested in your book? You're ready with some information. Then I've been witnessing your development with Facebook and blogging and more. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what keeps you going in that arena, as opposed to feeling that it's taking you away from your writing and what you, how you've benefited so far from your use of technology. Well, I actually cheat because when I'm writing uh, something, I usually try to post a little bit of it in my blog on my website and I, um, I'm using WordPress, by the way. Can I interrupt and say it hardly sounds like cheating? It sounds like another one of your wonderful ways of realizing optimistically that the writing life encompasses all of it, and you can use any piece of it to help yourself. It isn't just a diversion or something that's dragging you away from your work when you do it. It sounds like it brings you closer to your work. Yes, and I can actually get some really good feedback because on my blog, I have it automatically posted to uh, my Facebook page and to Red Room. Do you, uh, that's a you writer's, can talk a little bit about yeah, that. That's a want. writer's website that you can join for free. It's a good blogging platform and it's a good way to get feedback also. So since January, for instance, I've had between the two blogs on Red Room and my website, I've had 3,500 views, which is pretty good for somebody who's really not worldwide known. But because I'm writing about Africa and elephants, those views come from all over the world. And that's a really interesting feedback to have. And if you have your uh, blog, for instance, set up for people to like it, um, then they can repost it. For instance, my friends in Africa who own the three elephants that I visit, are also on Facebook and have many, many, many friends. And they will quite frequently repost um, some of uh, my blogs about their elephants. And so I get more readers that way. You know, it's a it's a very, very, very small world now in terms of um, being able to reach out and touch someone electronically. And so the more feedback you get, um, the better your writing gets. And the more that you get the writing out there, the more feedback you get. So it's kind of like this big circle. I, I, that's the way I look so at it. You're feeling very open about your work and, and very willing to share it in progress and then use that to continue shaping your, your written words. Definitely. They've, it's, it's a given that you should give stuff away in order to get things back. So I don't feel bad about posting photographs that, I'm, that are going to end up in the book. Everything is public. People can actually download it and print it out and send it on or whatever they want to do with it. It's just not the whole thing. They don't get the whole story. So Mm -hmm. hopefully they'll buy the book for the whole story. (laughs) I hope so, too. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 FM, Port Townsend. In case you have just joined us, you are listening to Sheila Bender and Discussions on the Writing Life. Today, Sheila is interviewing essayist Cheryl Merrill. Now that you've brought up photography, I wanted to. I know that you've taken stunning pictures of your elephants, Thanks. and um, I know that you've had good success in combining that photography with some of the publications, like the magazine Adventum that you came across. I want to tell us a little bit about how you found them and how they're working with photography as well as the writing. Adventum is a literary journal of adventure stories, and it's totally online. Um, you can, it's A-D-V-E-N-T-U-M. I think somewhere, it was probably in Poets and Writers Magazine, that I saw a call for submissions. So I went and looked at their website to see what they were doing. And it was the very first publication. And they do it twice a year. 
that was just last year, too. Um, it's run by one woman. She's very brave to do all this by herself. And she does very quality online publication of uh, photographic essays, which is kind of what I do when I'm working with a photograph and talking about elephants. Um, for instance, Brevity doesn't have photographs on their website, but many other journals do nowadays. And um, certainly uh, that helps to bring people to your, to your writing also. Adventum uh, just came out with a new publication, their third, and I have an essay in it, but this essay is about tracking lions on foot instead of elephants. So um, it doesn't have any elephant pictures in it, but it's got pictures of lions. And this website is accessible at adventum.com? Um, if you just Google Adventum, it's the first thing that pops up. Okay, thank you. So I know you've also been involved in pitching your book to agents and editors, is which is yet another wing of the writing life when you want to see your work out there in public. Anything you want to tell us about pitching and how you did it and what it means to you and where you go from there? I would say to make sure you have a really good idea of your project before you start pitching it to agents and editors. Certainly, if you're writing fiction, it has to be completely done. Um, you have to have a really, really, really good draft of your work before you start sending it out there. Nonfiction is a little bit different. You send out book proposals. So I've sent out inquiries to, well, let's see, I think 10 different agents now. I've gotten very positive feedback from all of them. They all passed, but they all requested more information and examples and the book proposal. And so that every time that I get feedback from them, I know a little bit more about publishing and a little bit more about what that type of agent is looking for. And maybe it's not my kind of agent. Maybe I need to look in a different direction. I haven't really pitched editors directly other than editors of the small press journals. Um, I've had a few pass on public on essays that have been published elsewhere. So it really depends on what the editor's looking for for that particular publication and what uh, emphasis they might be doing for the, that volume of that publication. And sometimes it's like, well, we just did that, and so we're going to pass, and good luck. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's a lot of... It's a lot of rejection, but I don't take it personally. You can't take it personally. Um, I just look at it as a educational process. So yeah. I'm still looking for an editor. Anybody know a good editor? Out there? <laughs> I mean, a good agent. Anybody know one? I have a, a thought that the fact that you're having good success with quality publications probably bolsters your confidence in your material and helps you not take it personally, which is another reason why people ought to be getting their work out there to the smaller press magazines, because that's affirmation. And you need a lot of it as you pursue the publishing market, because as we all know, publishing is in disarray in some ways of thinking, and everybody's trying to make money. And if they don't think they can make money right away, but they're trying to second guess because then nobody really knows what makes money. So I think that the fact that you're continually publishing and working on that must be very affirming to you. Well, yes. I mean, like I said, I've had lots of rejections, too. But um, And it also helps to have writers that you trust give you feedback on your work. It helps to be in a writing group. And uh, I know you've given me excellent feedback on what I, what, you know, cha various chapters that you've looked at, and other writers have done that, too. And so it, that also helps, because even if everybody's rejecting that one essay that you've just sent out and sent out and resent out and sent out again, and, and you think it's the perfect place for it to get published, and they say, oh, no, <laughs> no thanks. But, you know, sometimes they'll say at the very bottom, you know, you get these all of these form rejections sometimes, they'll say at the very bottom, we did like this, so... <laughs> send something else, which is very encouraging, yeah. you know, and do send something else. If they say that, send something else. Have you had success a second time then when you've sent something else? Yes, actually. Good. Yes. Good. So, Good track record. Yeah. Okay. You know of what you speak. So I'm going to ask you about the uh, rejections where people said it, where you said you're getting some feedback and that's valuable to you. Have you been in the position where you're getting contradictory feedback? Contradictory in terms of what 
the um, particular agent is representing, for instance, and um, I thought, you know, I'm right up their alley, and they go, no, this is not what we want. And so obviously their tastes have changed Mm. because you can research all you want and think you've got it nailed in terms of where you want to send something, and guess what? The market changes, or they've decided, no, we're not going to do narrative nonfiction anymore. We just want to do fiction because that's what's making money. So, you know, agents are, um, are partners in the process, and you just have to look at what they're telling you and and try to just say, maybe take it with a grain of salt and say, okay, well, I thought you were the one because of what you've done before, but guess not, because you said no. <laughs> do you ever think of approaching the presses directly without an agent? I do, but agents have such a arsenal of tools at their disposal. They can sell, I mean, you know, they do a lot more than just simply sell your work to a press. They can, they sell foreign rights. They sell um, e-rights now, e-publishing rights. And I really want to drive the Volkswagen instead of build one. You know what I mean? I would certainly um, keep track of what was going on, but there's only so much time that you have, and I would like to focus more on the writing. That said, um, if I find an editor that's really interested in the book, I can certainly approach agents and say, guess what? These folks are interested. So you see it like a two-way street possibility. Possibility, yeah. 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 You know, I, I would because the book, I believe, has um, potential for foreign publication is probably the main reason I'm trying to find an agent. And how are you looking for an agent? Tell us some of the, the ways you've found to connect with them. You can, probably the best thing is to look at books that you think are similar to yours and look at the acknowledgments and see who the agent is. And then Google the agent. Because authors most likely acknowledge their agent. They'd better. (laughs) (laughs) If they have an agent, it better be in the acknowledgments. um, And it better be near the top. You know, take a look at that agent and um, their agency and see if that looks like something you want to do. Um, There are lists of agents. For instance, uh, Poets and Writers has one online that's broken down by category, nonfiction, fiction, poetry, you know, that kind of thing. The other thing is to um, look at agents of books that are maybe in the same realm as yours, but like a 90 degree difference, because they might be am willing to take a look at something that's similar but not the same because they've already sold that one idea and maybe they want to sell a different idea. Um, and you can Google whatever your topic is and um, agent after that and uh, or literary agent and quite frequently find literary agents that way. There's just a ton of it, your imagination is probably, <laughs> you know, the limit on that. But there are some national organizations of agents as well. Um, yes, there are. And you can find that online by yes. looking up mm-hmm. agent as- associations or organizations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, have you ever f- have you felt that all of the agents you've approached with queries are legitimate have you ever worried that an agent's out there that you're attracted to that maybe doesn't really have the background they're claiming? No, because I've done my research. There is a really good website called Predators and Editors, and they have done all of their homework on who is legit and who is not. And if you take a look at their website, you can pretty much tell by the kinds of books that they've published whether they're legit or not. You know, that said, there's certainly a lot of um, interest in self-publication out there, too. And so that's a whole nother subject for a whole nother Program. huge conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think you have very good reasons for looking for an agent and international publication because of your topic and because of the platform you're building where people from all over the world are reading your excerpts and bits that you're putting out. So I totally understand your search and thank you for sharing all of the good websites and information. We only have a few more minutes. So is there anything else you'd like to particularly tell us perhaps returning to elephants? Oh, but I was going to ask you about yet another wing of your search for agents. I know that you have attended large writers conferences where some of the happenings are the ability to pitch 
And do you recommend that? Yes, I do, because it gives you the chance to get your book down into a couple of sentences. And it also gives you a chance to realize what agents and editors are looking for. And they will, um, you get usually five minutes or so with them, and they'll ask you a lot of really good questions that will help you focus on. So the next time you approach an agent, you'll have a kind of point of view Mm -hmm. that you're delivering. Definitely. Well, in our last minutes here, how about we return to the elephants? Um, Today, you've woken up. I'm sure that you've already thought about elephants. Anything particularly on your mind? Well, uh, I've, I'm working on an epilogue right now for the book, and I just returned from Africa and visiting Jabu Marula and Tembe and their herd mates, Doug and Sandy Groves. Everything had changed in the Delta. It ha- it's very watery there right now, and I'd never seen it like that before. So I'm writing an epilogue about sloshing around in the water with elephants. And uh, so, you know, those memories are very fresh and, and fun to think about and write about. And what was it like sloshing around in the water with elephants? I dang near drowned my camera. <laughs> um, I, I, my foot got stuck in some really deep, swampy muck, and I fell over. And luckily, the water wasn't deep enough to drown all of me. And the, so I had the camera in one hand up above my head, and so it didn't drown. And neither did I, but it was um, it was an interesting experience. Let me tell you, that sounds like a wonderful metaphor for all of writing. Uh, yeah, drowning in the swamp. <laughs> we feel like we're drowning in the swamp, but we hold our cameras high, maybe our tablet, our laptop, and somehow we don't drown and we come out with some new material. So anything in addition about will that will some of that be posted then for us to read? Actually, it is already. You um, are speedy. <laughs> And tell us again where. It's my blog, which is on my website, www.cherylmerrill.com. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks, Sheila. This was great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, Discussions on the Writing Life. If you have a writing challenge, author, or question you'd like us to include in future conversations, email us at sbender at writingitreal.com. Producer, sound engineer, and editor, Sheila Kalav. Executive producer, Larry Stein. And announcer, Kurt Vanderslice. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 FM, Port Townsend.